Okay guys, uh, thanks for making it out. Uh, this is a collaborative penetration testing with Lair. Uh, about me, I'm Tom Steele. Uh, I'm from Seattle, Washington. Uh, currently a uh, senior security consultant with uh, Percent Security. Been there for about two years. Um, there's my Twitter handle if you guys want to follow me, and I'll call you back. Go ahead and feed up the mic. Uh, I'm Dan Cohen. I'm also with Fishnet Security, a uh, security consultant with the security assessments team doing that test. My Twitter handle is up there as well. And, uh, together, Tom and I have developed this software. Okay, so. The current problem, the problems that we're trying to identify or fix with the tool that we're releasing today is um, that uh, when you're doing a penetration test, you, got, you get tons of data and they come in from lots of different tools, um, you know, manually you're, you're, you're creating data yourself and there was no e really easy way to manage that data. Um, there are some existing tools out there that can do it, um, but uh, you know, if, you're, if you're not using one of those, um, you know, basically you're just going to have tons of files open, tons of terminal windows with data and files all over the place and notes all over the place randomly and, and just, uh, yeah, not, not, not too much uh, you know, organization. Um, another problem that we identified was that when you were doing actual penetration tests with more than one person, there would sometimes be a lot of duplication of work because there wasn't any way to tell who, who had done what and who hadn't done what besides maybe um, just communicating with each other. But, uh, you know, so if you're communicating over, over IM or IRC or something like that, it's not always uh, the best form of communication. It's very hard to track who's done what. Um, you know, we some some things that some people use like OneNote or things something like that just didn't didn't uh, didn't work for us. Um, the other thing was just uh, thoroughness of a penetration test. Um, we wanted to create a tool that would, would really guarantee that we didn't miss anything, um, that we didn't miss any hosts, we didn't miss any services, we didn't miss any applications, um, things like that. So we saw we saw kind of a we didn't we didn't really couldn't find a tool that fit our needs, and so we just were like let's develop it ourselves. Um, so really, what we did is we. Um, we uh, we uh, asked for two months to develop a web application after we'd come up with some ideas, and we spent uh, two months uh, straight building this application, and um, just the past four months kind of improving it, improving it, improving it, and uh, letting our team work it out and find the bugs and fix the bugs and kind of in a reverse cycle. And so um, this is kind of the tool that we came up with to help us uh, solve all those problems. And so this is the architecture, and um, if you look on the right side of the screen, hopefully you can see that. And you can see at the top that you see a Meteor web server. So like I said, it's a web, it's, 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 at its heart, it's a web application. Um, the web application is built on top of something called Meteor.js, um, which is a JavaScript framework built on top of another framework called Node.js. So if you're familiar with Node and if you're with Meteor, you might have an understanding of what those are. But uh, real quick, the benefits of Meteor, I'm just going to cover some of them. Um, first one being data on the wire. Uh, when you first load up a Meteor.js application, it, it just ships you a whole bunch of HTML and JavaScript code and templates. Um, so the initial loading is, happens, and then the rest of the time it's just JSON back and forth with the web server. So it's very, uh, very quick, very snappy. Um, the next thing is, you know, obviously, um, being Node and being Meteor is all one language. What this lets you do is it lets us write the clients and the server code all in JavaScript, so we don't have to jump back and forth. And it's pretty convenient for, for some developers that way. Um, Next point I want to talk about here is uh, they have the concept of database everywhere. So um, it, it's, it has a MongoDB backend, um, and that database, when I say database everywhere, um, you can actually write your queries on the client, which is very, very cool. Uh, it's very, very convenient for developing a, a real-time application. Um, the next point that uh, Meteor has kind of going for it is a full stack reactivity. So everything that you do in Meteor when you're building an application is real-time. Um, it's meant to, you know, if something changes in the database, it's sent to the browser and immediately updates for you. Um, so that's kind of how you interact with the application, interact with the data once it's in there. And, uh, and it, it talk, let's talk about Mongo database. And so Dan's going to talk about how we actually get data from automated tools in there. Um, so, so we kind of came up with this concept called drones is the, kind of the name that we gave them. But it's uh, they're standalone Python scripts that actually interact with an API that we built. And uh, these Python scripts basically take data from a number of different tools, um, and then they parse the data, uh, aggregate it, normalize it, and then they put it into the, uh, the centralized Mongo database that we have running on kind of our master uh, Meteor server, right? Um, so we've only got these, these drones built currently because those are the primary tools that we use, but uh, uh, we built them in Python for a number of different reasons. Um, so first of all, we thought that, that maybe the community was going to be a little bit more adoptive of 
of Python versus like uh, JavaScript if we try to build these directly in Node. Um, JavaScript, if you haven't used it, is maybe a little bit uh, more difficult. It's got a steeper learning curve, I think, and it doesn't really uh, uh, go so well with like traditional logic and programming that, that you know, maybe Python lends to. Um, and then we also uh, separated the drones to just be kind of standalone scripts so that it was kind of loosely coupled with the actual uh, Meteor application so you didn't have to um, integrate tightly with Meteor in order to write a script. If you just wanted to write one for uh, you know, some tool that you have or some data set that you have in your organization, you know you can do that without having to know the entire like, Meteor framework. Um, and then, uh, let's see, we also did that um, just to try to get, uh, you know, just more community addition to um, the project. You know, we want other people to come in and help and help develop it. So that was kind of the, the decision why we went with Python rather than uh, than no. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it, it's a lot easier to uh, develop a Python script that can use an API we provide and um, then learn how to you know, actually put up a full web application. Um, another good point of why the drones are built like they are is that if you develop a drone and you're developing it in another language or it's it's code that uh, we don't want or something like that, and you don't have to worry about you know like. Getting anyone's approval, you just release it on yourself. You know, put it on GitHub, put it on Bitbucket, and other people can use it. Um, you know, no problems there. Um, so, uh, majority of this talk is actually going to be a demo because that's kind of the meat. Um, so here's Blair. Here's like kind of the main screen, and uh, I guess I'll, I'm going to create a demo project here. So once you've created a project and loaded the project, you're brought to, you're brought to this kind of uh, kind of this dashboard. And the first thing you see is like this host. And um, you know you, you, we don't have any hosts right now. You can add them manually. Any and you buy anything that we do with automated tools, we can also do manually. We also do we do a lot of manual testing. We want to manage that data. Um, but you obviously don't want to go add every single host that you're testing. You want to use the, the tools that we use every day. So um, one of those being um, in so I'm going to show how to use uh, the drones to import data into the app. All right. So uh, first thing you need to do is grab a project ID. This is the unique identifier for the database. So the drones know what to insert. Okay, so the first file I'm going to import was just a standard vanilla scan of my network and I had Metasploitable running to kind of just get some data. Um, so it's no version detection and uh, no operating system detection and no script scanning or anything like that. So it's just very vanilla, um, standard, uh, standard ports and everything like that. So. Let's see that I can improve this. There we go. So yeah, it just connects to the database, parses the XML, and inserts into the database. And what you end up getting is you get this list of uh, list of IPs. And you can see there's not much data there yet. Um, you know, the object operating system is obviously marked as unknown because MMAP didn't find anything. Um, and so let's load up uh, this 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 IP here. Just one, that one, the two. Um, so this next view is just a single host view with a list of services. And um, what I want you guys to focus on is this Telnet port. Uh, we can see that, the, that since we didn't do version detection with MMAP, the product is unknown. So that so you know on, on a, um, the idea here is on a pen test that you could you know uh, we like to do penetration testing starting off with very small targeted MMAP scans, and um, when you do that, you end up with tons of files and no real way to uh, put them together. And if you do, you, you're probably using like BIM or something like that with the final product. Um, and certainly other, there are some other applications that do this, but maybe ours will show some, uh, some benefits uh, that, are, that are not built into this. But, so my next step was just to show, the, show how it works is to do a version detection of that telnet port. And so that's what this second file that I'm going to import is, uh, has. It just has a version detection on that single port uh, telnet. And so if we're just looking at it, um, it gets the database. And if you guys notice, it immediately updated. There was no browser refresh. Um, the way Meteor works is really cool. The messages actually get sent up from the server to the client telling it that it needs to re refresh its data, to new data. Um, 
So that's very cool. Um, you know, we're big, uh, the, the way the drones work now is it's always has what I call one version of the truth. So it's, and it's always additive, it's never taking away. So if it sees that a port was open, but then it didn't have service to the product, it's gonna update it when it can. Um, the next thing that's really cool about the MF drone in particular is it parses the MF scripting engine for you, which is, the MF scripting engine's great, you know, just for checking for low-hanging fruit or anything else in particular. The only problem is that when you start running lots of script games, you get lots of files again, and how do you parse those out? Um, so this third one is actually um, a full MF of the environment with operating system detection, version detection, and uh, script scanning enabled. So you can see that the product is again updated, and we also get a note showing us the showing us the script scan output. So these are in, these are in uh, notes, what we call it. So this would be a service level note. Um, each port would get would get these based on the script output. And so a lot of the drones are built to do this. Uh, in particular, the Nessus drone will put individual vulnerability evidence in a service level note for you. Um, this is also the place you probably want to create um, notes for yourself as you're testing an application, testing an individual service. You want to make a note of maybe what you found or what you did, or you know, the reason why you skipped it or anything, everything like that. Um, I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to import a Nessus file now. Yeah, so right now we have we have parsers written for Nessus, Nexpos, MF, and Burp. Um, and like I said, there's an API that we, that, we, that we hope people would use and help us write more parsers. We just don't have the time to write these all day. Um, so, but, but if you have a need for something, you'd really like to see it written, you can certainly probably send us a, a sample XML file and we'd probably be able to write it for you pretty quick. Um, so I just imported the, the Nessus data and you can see that it kind of um, got updated with a bunch more information. Um, in particular, um, this host now, you can see all the vulnerabilities that are just associated with this host. You can link to that vulnerability. You can go to, to this particular port and see all the vulnerabilities that are just linked to this port. Um, and like I said, the, you can see uh, that the way the Nessus parser works and the Nexpos in particular, um, they actually parse the evidence per vulnerability and save them as a service level note. Um, also, what's cool about this is um, a lot of times, for particular reporting reasons, are just for uh, having the best updated information um, on things like operating systems. We put weight on different tools, so we happen to think that um, the Nessus and Nexpos engines are better at detecting operating systems um, rather than and that, certainly because they do certain, a lot more things like vulnerability detection and things like that. Um, so you can control which operating system has the most weight and which one um, you know you're going to base your your testing off of. Um, and while you're testing these, you can be tracking this information manually in a, in a centralized location easily by adding a new fingerprint, et cetera. Um, okay, so that kind of handles the data problem, right? The, I, need, I just need my data in a centralized location and I need it all to sync up. Um, the next issue is collaborative, and that issue involves, you know, um, we don't want to duplicate work and we also don't want to miss anything. So the way we came up to fix that is um, a color-based system. It kind of actually started out kind of funny because I used to use before this tool existed, I would use an Excel spreadsheet. So I would parse all my MF outputs together and then I would put it into this big Excel spreadsheet and then be using colors in Excel. Um, I particularly like Excel and I can't really share that over the network with my teammates and things like that. Um, so we, we kind of, uh, what version of the file do you have? What version of the file do I have? You take the top half, I'll take the lower half. And it didn't really work too well. So we came up, I, we just like, let's just keep the same color-based system and use that. So we have a color-based system for hosts, services, and vulnerabilities. And the colors, they're rather meaningless. They're not meant to mean anything. Now, what they mean to us doesn't necessarily have to match what your workflow is. We find that the colors, that this is the best workflow for us. And that's that gray is kind of undetermined state. No one's looked at it. Um, blue means that, um, to us, means that um, someone's currently looking at it. You know, someone's currently working on that. Don't touch it or you know, move to something else. Green means it didn't have any high severity issues or critical issues that gave you private information or um, just anything worth noting or football the network. Um, orange to us means that um, there's something very interesting there, but we just don't have the time right now, or we put on something else that's more interesting, but we'll come back later, and it's, it's just kind of a mental note. And red means it's pwned, like that's a foothold in the network um, that has you know, something like SQL injection that's feeding back private data, uh, stuff like that. 
So where Meteor comes in and is really cool is that when me and Dan are on a penetration test and we're both looking at this host space view, as soon as he clicks on a host to update the color. Oh, yeah, first we need to add him to the project, so that would help. <laughs> so yeah, this is the collaborator's view. This is the collaborator's view. Um, so basically, you know, you'll just see a list of users and these are the people that you can work on the project with. So I add him to a, as a collaborator. And if I come back here, and he clicks on a host. Um, and it, it took a while to get there, but uh, um, as soon as he clicks something, it changes colors immediately for me. So that data is pushed up from the server to the client, so there's no polling involved. Um, it's real, real time. Um, and so yeah, the way he changes his colors on most things is just by clicking them and toggling them. Um, and what's really interesting is, let's say you have everything green, or most things green, you want to see, like if you had uh, hundreds of posts, this would obviously, you know, you have a lot of them green, you only want to see what's maybe gray, you can actually just turn off green and filter them out. And you can do that anywhere, so this works just about anywhere. Also, all these searches are reactive as well, so if you just want to see Linux, you just type Linux. Um, the next kind of main tab here that we have here is uh, the services tab. This is what we found very useful, we didn't actually didn't add until about uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think. We basically wanted some way to see what's, uh, what individual services are open, individual fingerprints, meaning that um, all these four columns must match. Um, so this is, a, this is a unique list of core protocol, uh, service, and products. Um, and we wanted a way to query these and generate a unique list of hosts. That's convenient, right? Like, if you're on a pen test and you want to, and you have, you know, you know, there's a lot of Oracle stuff, and you just want to go test all the Oracle services, you can just use the search function to maybe search for 1521 or search for Oracle, um, and this is case insensitive, so search for Oracle. Um, also what you can do is you can simply just click it, which is very, very cool. Um, and you just click search again for like search. So um, as you're going through here and you want to get a list of all the HTTP servers, well clicking it probably wouldn't work, but um, what you can do is, uh, is just type HTTP. And so while these all have different fingerprints, these are actually individual lists of hosts. Right? So then you're on this list and you just want to look at the HTTPS servers. Simple, just, just clicking. Um, and like I said, this is all reactive. So if Dan's still work, if Dan's still importing MMAP scans and doing all kinds of crazy stuff while I'm looking at this, it will just automatically keep up for me and give me more data. I don't have to refresh or anything. Can you, can you copy that and post Oh, yes, so uh, very good point. So, uh, I, uh, I use all of my possible uh, CSS and uh, HTML skills to make this a text area with no styling so that you can easily just do control A, control C, and get the list. So uh, you know, that took me a while, it took about two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, next, the next tab really is, uh, is, is the vulnerabilities view. Um, and this just is a really standard uh, along the same lines, like we, we, have, uh, we have statuses here as well, so you can see what services you haven't checked out. And if you load up a particular vulnerability, um, you can see the description of standard evidence solution. You can see the hosts that are affected by the vulnerability. You can add hosts manually. That's what we do a lot. You know, when you when you found that host, uh, you know, this isn't just for automated tools. This is for manual testing. So the idea is that as you're finding vulnerabilities, you're, you're sh manual vulnerabilities, you're sharing them and creating all the data here so that your other testers can see that data too. Um, and you know, of course, it has CVEs and uh, vulnerability level notes. Um, project level notes, this is really good for keeping things like attack scenarios that you've completed or maybe um, rules of engagement or just like, you know, certain things that you want to share this project level, very basic. Um, the next thing that I'll show is the credentials are not now, so let's go create some. Let's assume that maybe we got on this box and we guessed some SSH credentials. So let's add some manual ones. And, uh, you know, they were running Kali and it's like free tour. Um, so what's really, you know, when you're on a pen test, you can sometimes just gather insanely, um, an insane amount of creds and hashes. And how do you share that data efficiently and keep, make sure they're keeping them all in one place? It's kind of difficult. Um, so it's very convenient when you add them to the service, uh, they're just kind of here for you. So it's just that convenience thing. Um, you already looked at the contributors view. Uh, the files view, we actually had done, it was pretty, it was pretty interesting. I actually had to wrote my own version of Dropbox. Uh, which I think is very cool, you can go use it, but uh, it didn't kind of meet my, meet my standards for this app. So um, we, are, we are investigating another, another piece. Um, Meteor doesn't have any sort of file uploading by default, um, but there, 
has been something made recently for it, so we're going to import that. I just didn't have the time to do that uh, this week. Um, so that's a very recent addition. Um, and this is very simple. This is just the command log. So as you're importing things from automated, command, automated uh, data sources, this will just show you what commands you've read or you've used, and um, and uh, you know what's been found and what's been added. It's just very simple to compare. Um, so um, as well as Dan, can you? I can't. Uh, I can barely see that. Yeah. So um, it also is Facebook compliance. It has chat. So. Um, <laughs> Well, so the, the idea that we, the idea that we thought is, you know, we, we if we're doing a perimeter engagement and we're we're at our home sitting there, we're probably not going to use this chat. We're probably going to use something else. Um, uh, but if we're both on an internal network and we're behind a strict firewall and we don't feel like breaking out, we just feel like sitting there and being restricted and not like you know stealing credits and authenticating to their proxy that type of thing, um, we can just use the chat. So, oh, okay, yeah. So Dan sent me a, a message and, and is telling me what to do. So. Um, that's very, very cool. Um, the next thing that I want to show you guys um, is, so I mentioned that Meteor is database everywhere. And I really meant that, so then they really meant to. Uh, you can actually do um, the equivalent of, um, if you're not familiar with NoSQL, the, the equivalent would be select, insert, um, update, and deletes. Um, they're actually called uh, select, update, or no, find, update, insert, removes in NoSQL. They're the same thing. But since the database is in the client as well, you can actually run database queries and do whatever you want in the client. Now, security best practices will tell you is, is, is you're going to say you should turn that off. And I completely agree. If you're developing a meter application, do not have these, these insecure settings turned on to let you do that. It's more of a development thing. But we, what we can do is we can take advantage of that to do crazy things in the browser. Um, so I'm going to, so there's a setting here. And we can, uh, so I'm going to deny first. And so we can allow client side updates. And what this does, it lets the client browser do whatever they want to the database. So you know, uh, there is admin setting, so I'm an admin, so I can only allow this. So if you didn't want to let everyone do this, you know, of course. Uh, so I'm going to allow this, and you get this, you get this security notification. Well, then you know it's probably not a good idea. You should only do this if you know what you're doing. Um, so we allow it, and then uh, I need Dan to uh, send me over his script. So what this, so what this lets you do is it lets you do anything you want in the browser console. So if you're in Chrome or Firefox, you can open up the uh, browser console and run database queries in there. So um, a common thing that, that we you know that we do is we write little scripts that help us out and share them amongst the team. And one of those ones that Dan wrote recently was, well, um, you know, if you're testing thousands of hosts and you know, hundreds of these hosts don't have any services available, there's nothing to test. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to go through and turn all those hosts green. So Dan wrote a little a nice, a nice script to do that, um, and so here's the, here's the content of it. And so basically, what this does is it's, it's doing a you know a, a, the equivalent of select statement on the host um, table collection, if you will, and it's pulling back all the hosts, and then it's um, looking to see if any of those hosts have ports open, and then it's going to turn all those ports green. So it's 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 kind of verbose, and but the, the idea is that anyone can, the community can write these scripts and share them and um, store them in their browser and show them and things like that. So what we can do is we can drop them to Developer console. And we'll lower this so you can actually see it happening. And so I know for a fact that dot six and four six don't have any ports open. So if we run this, it sure turned them as green. That's pretty neat, right? Um, and that's that's not any of us. That's just me. You're being awesome. So you know, we can't take any of the uh, kudos from that. But uh, it's very cool. So you can see how it can become quite powerful if you have um, different transforms. Um, you know, if you wanted to turn all the, you know, a lot of times the tools will report very, very different versions of like Windows Server 2008. And for reporting reasons, you just want to turn those all into Windows Server 2008. You don't have to care about R2, like, you know, dot one or something like that. Um, you know, it's very convenient to just turn them into all Windows Server 2008, for instance. Uh, I can't These graphs actually look better when they're not on a uh, projector because they're reading and they're reading it basically off how large the screen size is, and it's not accurate for the projector. So these graphs don't look kind of silly, but um, I think they're cool. They bounce and everything. So that's neat. <laughs> Bouncing is always good. Um, so uh, yeah, the next thing that, that you might want to take advantage of if you're, if you're doing a lot of penetration tests and writing lots of reports is um, it has an export function. Um, so this will take the um, 
the MongoDB collection or data collections and sync them all up into one JSON uh, JSON uh, object, and then we'll ship it over to an HTTP or HTTPS listener. I'll use HTTPS, but I'm not going to force you. Um, and again, it's a huge password. So we we have some proprietary tools that let us take this data and import it into our proprietary tools so that we can later report on it and things like that. So it's just a convenience thing for you. Okay, so the next steps that we have for the project are basically um, we, need, we know we need to write more parsers. We need to write more client-side code that can parse all the tools. Um, so if you're interested in, in contributing and you can code, that's great. You know, hit us up and we have a lot of interesting ideas. I know one in particular that I've been dying for is kind of like a um, pub sub type syncer for Metasploit so that it could sync the Mongo database with the Postgres database. That way, when you're using something like Metasploit Pro or even just Metasploit you know, from the console, um, you can import data into that and then import data into the layer and they both sync up. Um, it's a very complex issue that I've kind of spent nights thinking about how I would do it. So if you're smarter than me, you could really good. <laughs> That'd be awesome for you to come contribute to. Um, I think and, um, any other particular parsers that you think would be interesting? A lot of people have requested Qualys, I think. Yeah, I think Qualys is a big one. We don't use Qualys, so it's, it hasn't been a pain point for us, but probably a good one as well. Um, and another thing in particular is we're not, we're not, just because the API is written in Python, we're not, we're not like, we're not, we don't care if you write it in another language. Um, you know, if you go write a Ruby API, we'll probably just share it, we'll probably just give, you know, you send a pull request and have a Ruby API or something like that. Um, so, um, the other thing too is, we you know, we need more documentation. Basically, um, you know, we were coding this up until, I, I'm gonna say that we were coding this up until we got here, but that's not particularly true. I mean, we had the inter we had this application built three months ago. Um, I was just very particular and decided that I was gonna recode the entire front end in three days. Um, it looks a lot better, so. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, so we, we have, we've, been, we've been lacking on documentation. So if you'd like to get together with us and contribute that way, that's awesome, I need to it too. Um, and then we need to uh, basically uh, put a wiki out there so that you can um, you know, learn how to learn how to use the Python API. Learn how to run the document schema, things like that. And we'll, we will be doing that. Um, yes, sir. So, when you guys collaborate on this, where is this hosted? Like, do you have this on like an internal network that you guys? Uh, yeah. So with? at Fishnet, um, we have it in our lab on, on a server that's locked down, but we're kind of behind a network um, that's you know behind a VPN, things like that. Um, so this isn't this is not a, we will not intend this to be a hosted solution for you. Um, this is not. A, this is not something you pay for, it's open source. Um, so this so the kind of the way you get it, um, we have there's there's two ways you can do it. Efficient, we deploy it with Mon straight up MongoDB running SSL on the standard port, and then we have an Nginx reverse proxy speaking to the node application on HTTP. Um, that's not for everyone because that takes quite a bit of configuration. So what we've done for you is we put a lot of work into making pre-compiled packages that literally just start with um, it's, I'm not sure, it's, uh, it's literally just dot start dot sh and your IP, and it will walk you through creating certificates, creating database users, and going. Um, the other cool thing I think particularly about Node, um, and some people can disagree with this, but I think Node is very cool because it gives you a web server kind of out of the box. Um, we, we we kind of thought about doing it in Django, we thought about doing it in Rails, and the thing we didn't like is that we want people to be able to get up and running with this quickly and being have, and have a performance application quickly. And when you deliver a project that's Rails or Django or something else, there's a lot of configuration that goes into making sure the server works. Um, and we found that a lot of people would just use like the built-in WebRig server for a Rails thing, which is like single-threaded and it's perform well. So we kind of like, okay, let's look for a platform that's easy for easy to deploy. So yes, it has pre-compiled packages that you can just run on your own so on the own box. Um, but we do tend on putting documentation in place that will walk you through installing from source, I guess you could say. Um, so the next thing is that uh, it's on Git. Uh, the source code is on Git. The pre-compiled packages are about 100 megabytes each, and we have three of them. We don't have really good internet here, so we haven't been able to push them. But they will be up. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's probably the best way to get updates about it. Um, or, or you can follow Fishnet Security, and they'll probably tweet about it as well. Um, I'm also on Freenode under HydroWatt, so if you're on Freenode and you want to message me and have questions, or you want to work, and you, you want to keep start working on it, just go ahead and uh, give me a message. Um, and Dan is 
Dan's at uh, DJ Coman at uh, on Twitter as well. So, um, are there any questions? On the search, can you search uh, random text? I mean, I, I, So like a, maybe like a global search to search Repeat for, the question. Uh, oh yeah, so um, the question was if you can use some sort of regex type ability to maybe look for um, certain things globally in, in all the services. Um, currently we don't have that, but that's a very good idea. And we, um, we should probably have that. I think like a, a search tab that takes a regex and just shows like everything that it found, that'd be pretty cool. So I'll have to look at that on the Probably not easy, but... Uh, Hopefully, <laughs> we, 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 we talked about doing like a query builder, basically, where you could um, basically have every single key value that's in the database, be able to search on that, and uh, yeah, I think that's a very good idea, so thanks a lot for the idea. Yes? So when you click to change the color status, do you keep track of who it is that, that owns that one? Um, the, it, it keeps track of, it, if you notice, it had a last modified by, so the last person to click it, it will be tracked. So as soon as you click something, it says last modified by, which is why it works, because I can see if, you know, if, if it, I mean, if it was two people, yeah, you might not know, you, it, it, you know, you might not need that, but when you start working with 10 people, five people, you quickly need to track who's doing what and who's working on what, so. And, it, and it's just not person specific, it, it'll also track which tool imported it as well. Yeah, so if, it, if, it, if, it, if a guest like comes along and updates something, they'll say, oh, this is, update that. Any other questions? Uh, yes. The table that it creates when it has credentials, it yeah. has the IP address on it. Is that visible as well? Yeah. Let me just. Uh, can you sort it? So yeah. Repeat the question. Um, yes. Yeah, so he was asking if the credentials tab had uh, was uh, copy pasteable for the IP address, and if you could sort it. Uh, currently, it's not sorted. I think mean, it's just sorted by username. Uh, but you can click on this, and you could just uh, copy paste it like that. Like, could you like? Click on password and sort by tour, for instance, because if you have like a thousand credentials and you find it passwords used on like 500 hosts and you want to tell the client, hey, these all have 500 so it's That it. would be very convenient. So, yes, we will build that in. Um, <laughs> and just and just so you know, if you wanted to do that, you can always yeah. shop into the console and basically do something along the lines of like this. And I hope this works live and I don't get fooled myself. <laughs> This live, but yes. <laughs> uh, learn, learn MongoDB a bit better than me, and it will work. But uh, yeah, yeah, basically, you can write, you can, if, you, if you have a need to do something like that, it's all in the database. So, uh, you know, if you learn MongoDB syntax, obviously better than I do, it takes me one or two times to figure this stuff out. So, yeah, you, you would be uh, able to do it that way. And there's a question in the back. Was there a question? Yes, sir. How about starting rogues and things like that from the web app itself? Like, is this all driven from the command line, or can you start off like a batch jobs based on an IP list or something like that from whether it would um, or do you plan to? Uh, so the question was that if we can start the drones from the web interface um, based on like maybe a list of IP addresses or something like that. Um, yeah. The short answer is no. Um, the long answer is um, you know, why we did that way. We found that most of the time we were running tools from the command line anyway, so it was just convenient to have the drones on the command line and import the files after that. Um, we found that it was kind of an extra step to run a tool to generate a file and then take that file and then drop it into the server and then watch the server spin and then watch the server parse it and then wonder if it parsed it. Which can happen with some of the tools. Um, so that's kind of where we built it. Um, I could see a benefit in maybe, you know, I think I think there's other tools better suited for that thing, for that functionality. I think one that comes to mind is that's with Rel, uh, with running, you know, tools and tools from the browser and tracking that out. But I think uh, I think just the tool wouldn't set for that. But if that's something you want, uh, you know, we talk about it more for sure. Yes, sir. How do you uh, handle virtual hosts and keeping track of you know, unique IPs? Yes. Um, so, what tools are you using to handle virtual hosts now to find those? Um, just some internal commands to try to keep track of them. Okay. I was going to guess Nick, too, because you have a scenario hat on, but 
That's what I think. Uh, so so um, the question was, how are you managing? How are you managing virtual hosts? Which is very good because it's a lot something a lot of Pinterest is over overlook. And uh, so we've we've developed a lot of tools and, uh, um, to do that. And one in particular is Black Sheep Law. So uh, slight pimping out of my tool to go to check that out. But uh, yeah, we, you can actually you would actually probably want to build a drone for it. And we're thinking about building um, building a drone for a lot of these tools as well. Um, tell me what I'm on the X. Okay. So how that works is that how we how we would handle that is. Uh, Let's click on this one here. There's an internal network, so the host names aren't going to be particularly good. Um, if you actually go to the host names tab, it will parse through and look for all the HTTP and HTTPS ports and do a, kind of a best guess. Um, so you can add as many host names as you want here. So you can add them manually or have tools like Nikto or um, and Dark, Dark Property has a script that does it as well. So um, if, you're, if you're doing things like dictionary attacks or dictionary guessing on, on host names, um, you could probably build a drone to add this in there or add them in here manually, and then it will go through in here and create convenient links to the ports, so um, you can quickly get to them. Currently, we don't have any way of tracking which ones you've looked at. Um, you probably have, if it were me, I'd probably choose a service level note and, and track of it. But if it's something that you know, if it's something that you're that you're noticing that you guys are just, you know, it's like you have you always have hundreds of like as we do some tests and we just find hundreds of e hosts. Um, I can see it being its own status, each host name being its own, having its own status, and you can check that out. Now. I can see that happening. Um, the other thing I want to do is I actually wrote another tool which will go to a list of URLs and grab a screenshot. I want to somehow put in here a base64 encoded uh, PNG of this. Uh, you know, it's just a wrapper around Fam.js, but it'd be cool to have a, a screenshot of the, of, the, uh, of the image in here as well. So that's just something we're kind of thinking about how we're going to do. Uh, it's surprising it takes a lot of uh, brain power and, and thinking to, to Make a web app and make everything organized, and I'll just put crap everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it takes a while for sometimes. But have a question? Yeah. Um, so first of all, cool tool. Um, my question is kind of, what did you do to secure this? Because you don't want to like put all your stuff in there and then actually get home. Because right? um, the question was, what do we do to secure it? Um, so the database itself is running with authentication and SSL. So, so the, the, the credentials aren't sent in the clear to the database, um, and they do require credits, uh, obviously. Um, the application will not let you use the access over HTTP, um, and the application is also password protected. Um, and um, it uses something called SRP. So I'm not going to go into what SRP is. It's kind of there could be a talk all itself. A meter uses SRP, um, which doesn't really benefit us because we're transferring the credentials over HTTPS anyway, so we don't really care if we're encrypted beforehand, but. Yeah, so it's basically just a web app, you know, traditional app protected by authentication. Um, I mean, there's password requirements. You can't put a password under nine characters. But, um, so yeah, um, and then um, you know, um, uh, for someone to, for someone, the, the projects are are um, accessing data on the, the app. You can only access data that you're the owner or a contributor of. Uh, now, obviously, that gets interesting with the drones because you have to give a database password out, which is rewrite on the whole database. Um, our idea is that this is for teams. Uh, trust the people you're working with. I know that sounds weird, but you gotta trust people. Um, if you know we're hackers, if I want to get in that database, I probably have root on the server, you know, that it's deployed on. But the point, you know, if you had some, if you had some people that you wanted to share data with, what you could do is just have them send you the files, and you use the drones in port. That's what I would do. Um, on that note, we are looking at investigating maybe the drones speak to a REST interface. Um, Recently, there was a REST interface, kind of easy, easy to implement a REST interface, at least for Meteor. Um, so we could implement that, and the drones could actually just speak over REST interface after being authenticated to the app. So we're not relying on database authentication anymore. We're relying on application-based authentication. Um, but yeah, it's MongoDB, so the security wrapper on that, and then it's Meteor. So if there's any problems in Meteor, um, it's actually, they're actually very, very responsive and very, very, uh, you know, the, the, the quick to handle security issues, it's security at meteor.com. So if you find any if you find any issues in the app, they're probably in the underlying framework. And that would be very cool. That could be a talk in itself. So I encourage you to go break Meteor. Yeah. Yeah. Oh users with the Tor password. So you can extract IP addresses I did a lot of this stuff you know, to say. Yeah. I had that right. Oh, you're right. I didn't. I'm such a noob. And so this is this is almost exactly like what you would type directly in a Mongo client, like if you were the command line. It's slightly modified for Meteor. Um, 
Yeah. So you can just write a, write a query about that. And, uh, so that just gives you the count. Yeah. And it's actually um, MongoDB is created by Tengen, and Tengen has free courses. And so if you want to be using this a lot and be kind of like a master user, um, go and take any MongoDB course. It's probably a very cool idea. So I would encourage you to do that. Any other questions that we can ask or answer? All set? Okay, guys, well, um, thanks for coming to the tool. Um, like I said, it's on GitHub. So if, uh, if you want to go um, play around with it and have any questions, just uh, you know, get me on IRC or Twitter or anything like that. So thanks a lot, guys.